Happy Hanukkah, day three. I want to talk to you guys about something that has came to my attention. I want to entitle this, Understanding Dreams and God's Promise. You know, a lot of people have had dreams, including myself. And we often wonder, you know, what's going on? Because a lot of times... Things happen exactly like we dream it. Sometimes they don't. You know, Daniel had some dreams. And uh, some of the things that were told to him as the interpretation of those dreams still have not come to pass thousands of years ago. So, <clears throat> first thing I want to talk about is God's promise. You know, King David... Uh, when we go back to this Hanukkah thing that's going on, the Feast of Dedication, you see King David was the eighth son. Jesus Christ rose on the eighth day. The eighth day of Hanukkah is the Feast of Dedication. It says in the Bible that Christ <clears throat> was going went up to the temple during in Jerusalem during the Feast of Dedication. The Maccabees were the ones that freed the grip on Israel and Jerusalem in particular, and they overthrew their these guys that had overrun the city and taken over for years, and <clears throat> they restored the worship, and that's where Hanukkah comes from. And a lot of times, you know, they didn't have a eight stand or an eight branched menorah the menorah was the temple menorah it just burned for eight days you see there's a central candle that is to be the light that never goes out and then they would light and then they lit the other ones in celebration of hanukkah and uh they had one cruise of oil and that lasted for eight days until they were able to make another cruise of oil see it took priests and they had to do these certain kosher things to get the oil to burn in that lamp, according to what God said. So, we have God, and there we had King Saul, which was the first king, and <clears throat> God told, the people wanted a king, and God said, look, you don't want a king, you want me as your king, and they just kept rejecting him. <clears throat> you know, he was supposed to be, uh, God himself was supposed to be their king. He said, I want to be the one over you. And they didn't want that. They wanted to be like all the other nations. So he said, okay, I'll put a king over you. And then he's going to take taxes from you and do all these things. Anyway, Saul sinned against God. And so God was going to remove him. Even though this king was blessed by God, he made a mistake or made several mistakes. And then God said, well, I'm going to replace him. And he replaced him by having the prophet go to Jesse and he said well the lord said god said that the king the next king will come from your children and so he brought up one by one all the boys and then none of them got the holy spirit didn't tell the prophet this is the one and then he said well do you have another one he said well we have this one he's a ruddy little guy you know he's not very old and so he said we'll bring him up here and then god said well that's the one i'm going to use and so the prophet anointed king anointed david king over israel and then saul got word of this and instead of saul oh man i can't hold that phone that long <laughs> in that one hand let me try this with too much light on that side so anyway king saul decided that he didn't want the will of God, you see. And so he began to try to hurt David. And he he made plans against God's anointed that God had chose. And more sin came from that. And it ended up that uh, he chased David for a long time, trying to kill him. He threw a spear at him and all these things. It's a beautiful story if you read it. Anyway, 
Saul ended up being killed in battle as well as I believe he fell on his own sword, but they consider that that you know he was in a battle whenever his end came. I believe he was wounded and then he fell on his own sword and killed himself, took his own life and uh, Jonathan his son was there and he also died. And uh at the end of David's life he restored to Jonathan's son they call him Maribar, Maribar, and also a very complicated name, Mitzvah. I'll I'll put it out there and let you guys see it if I remember. But anyway, <clears throat> if we notice David's life, he ran, he hid, he did all these things. He had to eat the showbread, which is not allowed, and Abigail, and. Uh, he did all these things, and finally he became king. And then after he became king, he sinned. He committed the act of adultery and murder to to cover up his adultery. So David was still restored. You see, God is faithful. What I'm trying to talk about is the faithfulness of God, even though in our eyes it doesn't seem like he's faithful. And even though it it may take years, it took years for David to become king and the struggle. And then once he was king, there were, uh, his son Absalom tried to over Absalom tried to throw overthrow the kingdom. And David suffered a lot for what he did. You know, and a lot of the Psalms are written. And it even says in there that uh, in God's word that um in Isaiah 46 and 4, in the ESV, it says, Even to your old age, I am he, and to your gray hairs, I, am, I will carry you. I have made, and I will bear. I will carry and save. <clears throat> you see, and in the NLV, it says, save you. And there are so many different verses and the interpretations of those, you know, to try to clarify what the words say, because a lot of times in the Jewish, the Hebrew writing, there are no connective words, you know, to connect things together. And so you have to kind of look at it and judge what it means. So there are different versions of this. And so when we have King Hezekiah, he, he was a great king and he, destroyed all the idols that were under all the trees and the altars for those idols. And he turned, tried his best to turn Israel back to God and restored worship in the temple and all these things. And then at the end of his life, the prophet Elisha came to him and said, well, you're going to die. Get your house in order. And he rolled over to the wall and he began to pray. Hezekiah did in his bed and he began to pray and asked God to give him a few years. And as the prophet was leaving, it says that um, the Lord spoke to the prophet and said, go back and tell him I'm going to add 15 years. And so Hezekiah said, well, how do I know? You know, kind of, he was wondering. And so the prophet said, well, ask God something to prove this. And he said, how about the sundial? Then the thing would go forward or go back which one do you want and hezekiah said well it's an easy thing to make the sun dial go forward you know the shadow but it's a really hard thing to make the shadow go back so make the shadow go back and he made god made the shadow on the sundial regress i believe it was 15 degrees or like almost 20 minutes so God extended his life 15 years and he did all these things. And what I'm trying to say is that God's promise, though they seem late coming or never to appear, always happen in God's perfect time. You know, God has a timing in everything that he does. And so a lot of times we see these promises. And what are these promises? He said that if you confess your sin he's just and faithful that he will forgive us he says in there that 
the good works that he started in us, he will finish. There are hundreds of promises of God and his word for us. And so, you know, what I want to say to you is that God loves you and God made these promises and God promised us through a special revelation that came to Paul the Apostle that we would be transformed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. It doesn't say any of that stuff in the book of the Revelation. None of it. It says in the book of Revelation that he sends his, uh, Christ himself goes and an angel also goes, and they have a sickle and they reap the earth. It doesn't say uh, that people are changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, and that we're caught up to be with him. It doesn't say that at all in the book of the Revelation, anywhere. <clears throat> so, we have this promise, and God's prom one of God's promises is that um, we will not endure His wrath. And that's what the tribulation is. If you read the words in there, it says, this is the wrath of the Son, the Lamb, the wrath of and this other part is the wrath of God. But yet Christians will say, well, we're going we're gonna to go through that. We're going to see that. And then how do they adjust what God said in there, in their own lives? You see, is God a liar when he says, I'm not, Christians aren't going to see that, that people that believe in him never do. Look at Noah, as it was in the days of Noah. What happened in the days of Noah? The flood came, but he was taken up away from the flood waters. How about Enoch? It was a wicked generation and Enoch was walked with the Lord and he was not. How about Elijah? He was taken by a whirlwind. God's promises are sure. We have to trust him. You know, that's the most important thing. Trust God. Read His Word. If you know His Word, He says, my people perish for a lack of knowledge. Many times we just sulk or what, whatever makes us happy or suits us at the moment. When we forget or we deny the power of God, God is, God is love and He is going to save us. So... You know it's going to happen in its perfect timing. Whether it's, I believe it could be this year, maybe near Hanukkah. But um, if it's next year or the following year, I believe the Lord is coming soon because of His promises. The, the 70 years, Israel is 70 years old this year. That's a generation the Jews are going to celebrate it next year on May in May of 2018. So I don't know if that has anything to do with it. We know about the, you know, there's a an ancient uh, prophecy by a rabbi about the amount of jubilees that would pass. Well, this is the last jubilee in that prophecy, and everything else that this man said has happened. And the Jubilee that happens this year, which is 2017, is one that fulfills uh, the beginning of the Messianic age. So, and this is a rabbi that didn't believe in Christ. So we can have, you know, there's tons and tons of evidence if you want to look for it. I think God really wants us to believe in him. Read Psalms 94. So um, <clears throat> I want to talk to you real quick about God's promise and how it relates to something that Brother Brian told me. And he, I don't know if he ever told any of you guys, but I wanted to talk to you about this real quick. Brian had a dream. He had two dreams about the rapture happening. And the one of the first dreams he told me, and I can't remember the whole thing, but I remember he said, um, that he was with his daughter and the rapture occurred and they were caught up. 
And then he had another rapture dream where he was driving in a certain area of town and he was at work that particular day. And he saw these certain landmarks and then the rapture happened. And he used to tell me, well, Brother Gary, I really think this is close because in that dream of the rapture where I saw the landmarks, he says, I never drive in it. Very rarely do I ever drive in that area. And he says, here recently, I've really been driving a lot in that area. So I'm thinking the Lord is coming soon, you know, and we talked about maybe the Lord might come during Hanukkah. You know, things I've seen, other people have seen. Mark Murchison saw that sleigh in a dream and he was taken up, Him, and, he and his wife and his daughter. Many other people have seen these sleighs. I don't know that that's the time. And people want to get on you for watching. You know, the Lord said to watch. If you read those scriptures, it says to be diligent, to watch and look for the returning of the Lord. In fact, I believe it says there's a crown for those that are doing that. But other people say, well, don't say anything. You know, and I don't believe that we should give dates, but we can say there's hope. So, Brother Brian had these dreams, you know, and then about being taken up in the rapture. And many of us have had dreams. And here's the thing. As we all know, Brian didn't get taken up in the rapture. He didn't go with his daughter. He didn't go driving at work. He died. And people go, well, look, there's God in a dream showing Brian something and it doesn't come to pass. <clears throat> but I want to talk to you guys about things, personal things that I knew. You see, Brian told me he loved his dad and he was instrumental. He was the one that helped his dad, his father, his earthly father, find salvation. And right after he did that and got his dad to to humble himself and repent before the Lord and become a Christian, his dad died a certain time after that. And Brian began to have these dreams, and he would dream that he would be going to his old house, back to his old house. He used to live in Oklahoma, and so I believe that's where it was, and he would go there to his old childhood home, and he'd find his dad there. And him and his dad would talk, and they would work on projects together. His dad's in heaven. He's like, I don't understand these dreams. Why am I going to meet my dad? Why am I going home? And he said that he would dream that he dreamed that he was in heaven and he was at the wedding supper. And he was like, Brother Gary, I think maybe my mom is going to be saved and my other sister. Because he had a mother and another sister and she, neither one of them were saved. And he had a third sister that was really mean to him. On his channel, she would say things. She'd come on there as a pretending to be somebody else and say horrible things to Brian. And Brian really loved the Lord and he really worked hard. You know, he worked so many hours. He'd work six days a week. And then he'd work after work till late at night, one, two o'clock in the morning sometimes. And then he had still had time to talk to people on the internet. And he still had time to pray for people personally. And he had a prayer list and he went over it. He prayed for these people every day. Just about, I guess. So that's what he told me anyway. All we know is what somebody tells us. And so here's the thing. Brian kept having those dreams. And and now that it has happened, I can see he was dreaming about going home. And maybe this tragedy happened to Brian caused his mother because in the dream he says, I'm, on, I'm at the table waiting with people I don't really know. And he says, my dad's there with me. And then pretty soon here comes my mom. And his daughter and his wife. And he says, and my sister came. But my other sister didn't come. So I don't know if she's going to be saved or not. She she really hates God. And so maybe this was a dream from God showing Brian that he would be there first waiting at the table because it was just him and his dad. You see, and then here came his mother and then his wife and his daughter. So we don't know the timing of these things or how things are going to work or what God is trying to tell us. God has given us hope. You know, a lot of times there is no hope. And so God has to remind us, hey, listen, there is hope, he says. You're going to be taken away from this world and you're going to be with me forever. And I believe that's what God was showing Brother Brian. So these dreams that we have, and we're all so steadfast in our belief of what these dreams mean. Even myself, I do that sometimes too. 
And I've made mistakes. You know? Anyway, you know, there's been many people that have had dreams about the rapture happening and say in the dream they have a little child and they do have a little child now, so they think it's got to happen now. God has truly shown me that this is going to happen now. There's one guy that you you may have watched a long time ago. It's probably been a year and a half or more. And he, he was in a Ford uh, Expedition, a big truck. He said he had seven kids and his wife, and their baby was like, I don't know, a month to three months old, and it was in its car seat. And he he dreamed that he had a flat tire and stopped alongside this certain park and... He had to get a jack, and there was a jack in this, like a tent camp that was down in this park. And here's the thing. The rapture hasn't happened in almost two years since he dreamed that. And so, you know this place where I live, just car after car, noisy car, motorcycle, up and down every day, all day. It's ridiculous. Anyway, um... That rapture dream didn't happen, and he was so adamant and so sure. In fact, he went to work and was te testifying, and he caused them, you know, to. they ended up firing him. He lost his job and everything. And they just moved into a new house and stuff, or a newer home to them. And then there's another black guy that I saw that was a weightlifter, and he had a dream of the rapture happening while he was at church with his father. And he was on fire about that. And then there's another black guy that I saw that had a baby in the dream, the rapture dream. And, and then they really had a baby later in life. And he thought, man, it's going to happen now. Well, that was, that was probably a year and a half to two years ago. You see, so sometimes God is showing us things. And these dreams are so real and so vivid that they cause us to do things and say things that we wouldn't normally do. And I believe that's the reason that we have these dreams is so that we can witness and testify to those around you. Because you never know when today is the last day that you're going to see somebody. Twice in my lifetime, actually three times, my brother David died and it was just a sudden thing. And I was talking to him on the phone, I mean on the internet through uh, Microsoft used to allow you through their uh, Hotmail account to talk to people, message them, message them. And three days later, my brother was dead. And then a friend of mine, when I was in high school, I felt I needed to speak to this person about the gospel. I just kept feeling this urgency. And I was trying to find the right time. And we were in science class together and he squirted water on me and I squirted water on him and went back and forth and he got angry at me. And that night was Friday night. And he, he was in a friend, him, he and a friend of mine were together and and they got in a car, an accident. The truck rolled over. He was driving and it killed him. And I never got to witness to him. And then Brother Brian, the day that he died, there were some things the Lord laid on my heart to share with him. And he and I had had a little argument before this. And so I didn't want to ruin this. You know, I saw I'll tell him later. And I didn't say anything to him. And he died that night. So sometimes God puts this urgency in our hearts so that we can testify to people and get those people to see that the Lord is real. You know, it may be their last chance on earth, really, to find the Lord. It may be their last opportunity to surrender to Christ. And so God puts this on us and we're, we risk everything. When God really converts you and changes your heart, you'll do anything for Him. So I want you guys to have faith, to believe in the Lord, to trust in Him. Look at what's going on in Israel right now. Donald Trump just acknowledged that Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. It always has been. There's tunnels underneath there where Hezekiah tunneled under there. There's, there's, there, are, there is tons of evidence that prove the Jews were there, that they had a temple near where the Temple Mount is. You know, I believe that was Fort Antonia myself and that the temple was actually down and a little bit lower. That's why Paul said that they sent the Roman garrison was sent down to get him from the Jews at the temple and take him away because they were going to kill him. There was like 400 men came. So anyway, let me pray for you guys. And just think about this. The promises of God are sure. And there's tons of scriptures. Just type in Google. Promises of God, and you'll get this list 
of promises. You know, we can have faith, we can have joy in our heart because we know that no matter what's happening to us today, these things that we see, these whatever you might be going through, God is there with you. You know, there's this lady that uh, that I met today and she was, she's Brother Manuel's acquaintance and they were talking to me. We were all three talking on the phone uh, together and she related a story about how she was trying to do this thing for God and bad things have happened to her. She got pregnant. She's 44 years old and then her house burned down and she went outside she was out in the yard and just destroyed and nobody would help her. Even her own family would pass by and wouldn't even say anything to her. And so she was out there and she fell down in the rain. It was pouring rain. Her house had just burned out. She had nowhere to go. She's crying. And then she'd got a ticket for the, the house and they, you know, cause they want you to, to knock it down and remove all the rubble. She has no money. So, she said she was crying and she said, God, why has this happened to me? And she even said a few curse words and became angry at God. She said, and then there was a sound. You know, she's in the rain crying and in the mud on her knees. The rain's pouring down on her and she's yelling at God. And the rain is coming down and she's soaking wet and these birds fly off and she looks, looks up, what is that sound, you know? And a single dove flies out of the group of doves and comes back and lands on the top of her head as she's sitting there in the rain crying. And then she, she asked God if that was from him and stuck her finger out and the bird flew away and came back and landed on her finger and then looked at her, cocked its head back and forth. God is with us. And she said, God, I'm so alone. I have no one. Well, my brother Manuel had gotten an argument with his wife and took a different route that day and happened to come by there and find her, this lady that's just depressed and down. The devil, a lot of times, put it, puts us in Lodabar. Go look that up. And we're, it's a place of no help, of no word from God. And we're in pain and we're in sorrow and we're depressed. And you know what? God is there with us, even though we can't hear him. Just like her. She thought God can't hear me, and these and this dove flies and lands on her head, and then flies around and lands on her finger and looks at her. A wild bird. God hears you. God hears every word, every thought. It said Christ said that He hears your thoughts before you pray them to Him. That's why we don't have to keep begging Him over and over again. God hears. Anyway, let me pray for you guys. God hears us. The Lord is coming. Hang on, the signs are all over. The Lord had given me that dream about the woman and all the scientists looking for this sign in the heavens. A sign, and he told me before that that there's, a pro, that there's a prophecy about a woman in the stars that everybody knows, even the Jews and the, that's the people that don't believe in God, they even know some of them. So the thing is, that has a big significance and it's a marker on a signpost and it's a it's something that tells you hey a corner's coming up here pretty soon slow to 35 all right god is not slack he is not he knows he hears us give him a chance depend on him lean on him he's a god of the last second israel is being hit by missiles from hamas and them Pray for them. Anyway, dear Heavenly Father, we come before you and we ask you to help us recognize that you're with us, that you're helping us, God, that you would help us have faith in our hearts to believe you. Even as Christ said, when I come back, will I find faith? God Almighty, we ask that your Holy Spirit dwell in a special double portion with every single person that's watching this video, that anointing would be upon them, that you'd help them in their loneliness, God, and in their terror and in their trials that they're going through. Paul said it, don't think it's strange, this fiery trial that comes upon you. God Almighty, help each and every one of us to realize that you are not slack, that you are coming, that you woke all of us up 
Each one, many of us in 2011, that you are coming. It's been almost seven years. We trust in you, God. We reach out our hands and praise to you. We thank you, O Lord God. Blessed be your holy name. Blessed be your name. We pray and ask you to undertake for us and for Israel and for all these Christians in these Muslim-controlled lands who are being persecuted. God Almighty, undertake for the Christians and for the people who are in North Korea, God, and the people that are in South Korea, God, and across the world, the people that are in China and in Japan and places that have no way to know about Christ. God, reach out to them, Father God. Undertake for the Christians that are in Russia, God, and in China. Father, help in the mighty name of your Son, Yeshua. The Christians that are in Jerusalem and in Israel, God, help them be a light to our brothers and sisters in the mighty name of your Son. We reverence you and we thank you for this time, God. In the name of your Holy Son, Yeshua, Jesus Christ, in the Greek, thank you. Amen.